I would encourage you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And we're going to be looking in, at verses 43 through 54 this morning. And uh, for, I would ask if you would please stand with me out of honor for God and His work as I read. John chapter 4, verses 43 through 54. After the two days, Jesus departed for Galilee. For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having sent all that he had done, in, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast. For they too had gone to the feast. So he came again to Cana of Galilee where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son. For he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, Come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked him the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed, and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he came from Judea to Galilee. Thank you. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. In his classic book, the Problem of Pain. I think about that title. Just that title alone should get us interested. The Problem of Pain. Author C.S. Lewis writes this about most people's view of God. He says, most people regard God as an airman regards his parachute. It's there for emergencies, but he hopes he'll never have to use it. Think about that. Think about that relationship there. How do most people regard God? And Well, God's there, but he's like my parachute. I hope I never have to use him. And I think many people, even today, I think especially those with some kind of religious background or religious upbringing, they live a life of what I would call a foxhole faith a foxhole type of faith. Like a soldier on the front lines of battle, when bullets start flying and mortars start exploding and his brother soldiers are falling next to him, he begins to panic that he too will die and then he begins to bargain with God. God, if you get me out of this safely, I will follow you the rest of my life. If you just get me out of this crisis, out of this mess, I will follow you. And oftentimes the Lord does graciously answer this prayer. And then safely the soldier comes through the battle. Well, the question becomes this. Can a foxhole faith be a genuine faith. Of course, the real test of this man's faith is measured by what he does when the pressure's off, when he is out of harm's way. Will he then forget God and, and simply go back to his old life? Or will his faith actually develop into a real relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? 
Now, as people, I think uh, we are kind of critical, maybe cynical sometimes of this type of faith. And it's probably because we have had experiences with people. We know people who, as we have seen it, they only use God as an emergency. They only use God when there is a serious health crisis, when there is a job loss or a loved one dies. And the first thing they seem to do is they want to turn to God, and, and usually that takes the form of they want to ask you, will you please pray for so-and-so, for this? Maybe they even start you know, coming to church and being involved while that crisis is going on. But then when the crisis is averted, they're nowhere to be found. They stop coming to church. When you try to talk to them about how things are, oh, oh fine, and they don't want to go into greater detail. Because of that, let's be honest, we become suspicious, don't we, of that person's faith. What were you really believing in that moment? Why did you, why is it okay to turn to God when there's a crisis, but when everything is fine and great, and we want to talk about who he is and what he's doing, you're kind of, eh. Let me say this, beloved, why, I think we need to be cautious with this type of person. The reality is this. God uses pain to drive us to him. In fact, I think that is the primary purpose in pain. It's to point us, it's to point others to their need of Jesus Christ. In fact, C.S. Lewis, again, he helps explain this purpose in that book, The Problem of Pain. He says this, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. How hard it is to turn our thoughts to God when everything is going well with us, right? Isn't that when most people think, well, I don't have a need for God right now. Everything in my life is hunky-dory. I'm healthy, my family's healthy, we have plenty of financial uh, prosperity going on, we're able to do what we want, life is going on just fine. And so God allows pain into our life to arouse us, to shake us, so he can move us toward him. Well, beloved, that's really the central point in our passage today. Jesus performs here his second miracle recorded in the Gospel of John. And in doing so, he illustrates this truth, that God's desire is to move us from a crisis faith, looking only for a solution to our problem, to a confident and confirmed faith in Jesus Christ alone. And so why... While a crisis gets our attention and God graciously meets us in that need, that's just the beginning. He wants us to believe in him not only because he delivered us from our crisis, but also because he is the only savior of the world and he is worthy of all of our trust and worship. So this morning, let's look at, if you would, some lessons of faith we can learn from this passage about faith in Christ. The first thing is this, faith in contrast. Faith in contrast. That's really verses 43 through 45. And verses 43 through 45, it kind of sets the stage for us of what's to follow. Jesus and his disciples... They have left Samaria after two days of fruitful ministry. And they now head north, continue on their journey. 
Verse 44 occurs in the other Gospels in connection with Jesus' actual visit to his hometown of Nazareth. That's in Matthew 13, Mark 6, and Luke 4. So we have this little parentheses in verse 44. And as we have seen already, John does these little commentary things. And in our Bible, they're usually marked with parentheses. He adds these little footnotes, if you would. For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. And it's the same region he's in, but he goes to Nazareth, and that's recorded in the other Gospels. And so Jesus is, John is explaining the reality that Jesus Christ faces by contrasting for us this warm reception he had just received in Samaria with the general response that often happens with Jesus' very own people. Of course, John reminds us of what he previously has said in John 1.11. That Jesus came to his own, and those who were his own people did not receive him. So Jesus went to Galilee because he was following God's will. And in spite of knowing that he wouldn't be honored in his own country, he goes still. But then, look at verse 45. He adds this, which seems to say the exact opposite of what we just saw. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans, what? Welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So one verse says he wasn't welcome. The next verse says he's welcome. And it's the same region. Which is it? Is he accepted or is he rejected by his own people? The answer is simply both. It's both. There are two clues to interpreting verse 45 in this passage. The first clue is the phrase, the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast. That refers back to John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, where it says that many Jews believed in Jesus because they saw the signs that he had done at the feast in Jerusalem. But the problem was that belief was only a shallow faith. And we saw there in John 2 that said that they believed in Jesus, but Jesus didn't believe in them or believe in their believing. Meaning he knew what was in their hearts. He knew they weren't really trusting him for the right reasons. They just liked all the... uh, Uh, the entertainment and healings, and man, he would feed us. I mean, yeah, who wouldn't want this guy at his party? The reality is this, beloved. It is very possible to believe certain things about Jesus Christ without truly believing in him. You can have all the facts And say you believe the facts, but not actually trust in him. And sadly, I think that's where we find ourselves with a lot of churches today. It's filled with a lot of people who might give some kind of lip service to the facts. They believe something about Jesus, but they themselves are not putting their trust in him. And the second clue here is the statement that Jesus makes over in verse 48. When he's in the middle of the conversation with this official about his son, Jesus says to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Now, here's the key. In the Greek, that word you is a plural, not a singular. So it's not you, Stephanie. It's you, Heartland Center. Understand? And so Jesus is saying the Jewish people as a whole, the you as a whole, they sought him for superficial reasons. Unless you see great signs, you're not actually going to believe in me. Unless I perform for you, you won't follow. Now, this is contrasted with what we just saw last week with the Samaritans. 
The Samaritans believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they did so without lots of signs. In fact, in verse 41 and 42, it says they believed because of the woman's word and because of Jesus' own word. That's all he did. He spoke to them. He was the word himself, and so he spoke the word of God to them, and they put their trust in him as the savior of the world. Now we have this other group, the Galileans, the Jewish people here. And they are seeking Jesus because of the signs that they saw him do previously in Jerusalem. And so what G John is doing for us here is really contrasting the faith of these two group of people. And what he's doing is he wants to challenge each of us this morning to say, which group are you in? He wants us to move from that shallow faith to a deeper faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trusting him truly as the Christ, the Son of God, which leads to eternal life in his name. And here's the connection with verses 46 through 54. They illustrate the point of verses 43 and 40 through 45. We get to see a man who starts out with a shallow faith and goes to a deeper faith. The official comes to Jesus with a Galilean faith, if you would, and he goes deeper and has a true, genuine faith in Jesus Christ for who he really is. Well, the second thing we see here is a faith in crisis. That's really verses 46 through 48. John notes that they came to Cana of Galilee where Jesus made the water into wine. And then he connects it again in verse 54. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. John wants us to remember the reason for these miracles. Why am I telling you these things? The first miracle, as we saw in John 2, it resulted in the disciples specifically believing in Jesus Christ more. The second miracle here, it results in the official and his family believing in Jesus. And so again, John is keeping with his purpose for his entire gospel that he gives to us in John chapter 20. He's given these things so that you and I might believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this man is simply described in this passage as an official. But we really don't know any other kind of details about him. He probably had, you know, certainly had some authority. He probably had some kind of position. He probably had some kind of power. Also probably had some kind of wealth. It's clear he has servants as his servants tell him later on what happened with his son. And by this time, Jesus' reputation is growing. After that uh, first visit to Jerusalem where he performed miracles. And he's continuing on. And everywhere he goes, he's spreading the word. And he's spreading the gospel. And he, he's doing these great signs. And so his reputation this first year is kind of growing. I mean, it's a small region. And so word is spreading about him. And so this man apparently has heard about Jesus. And he believes at some point here, well, Jesus, he can help. My son is about ready to die. I've heard that this man has healed people. I've heard that he's cast out demons. So maybe he can save my son. And this man is in crisis. I mean, think about mom and dad, your, your children laying there dying, and you know they are going to die. Unless God intervenes, they're going to die. Would you not be trying to do everything you can do to save them? That's what's going on here. This official is saying, if Jesus can help, I'm going to go. I'm going to try to convince him to help me. But here's the key with this. The implication in this passage is that this royal official, he would not have actually sought Jesus out unless there was this crisis, unless his son was dying. Otherwise, he was content and happy with his life. He would have just kept on going as is. 
The only reason he's interested is because his son is dying. And this account really reveals for us, in the end, our true helplessness as people. We all think things are just fine. I can handle life. I can deal with problems as long as they're not too big. Until the Lord allows some crisis in our lives that we know we cannot tackle. And he does that to show us our need for him. All of us have faced afflictions. Trials, hardships, all of us will face eventually death, no matter what. And so in desperation, this official, he traveled 20 miles from Capernaum to Cana to find Jesus to beg for help. Now, for us, traveling 20 miles is not a big deal, but you have to remember they had to walk. Maybe he rode a horse or a donkey, but it was still a trip. Here's what this teaches us. There are really two responses that we can have in our own life, beloved, to crisis. Two things, you ready? We will either have a, a response of belief or a response of bitterness. God uses crisis in our lives so that we might seek him in ways that we would never have done so otherwise. Crisis from a spiritual perspective is not just an inconvenience, it is rather an opportunity to connect with God. Let me get real personal here. Know what your belief is in all the COVID crazy. We have been in this for six months. And I believe one of the things that God is trying to do in this time is prepare us as his people for the next set of whatever is going to happen. One of the things I have been concerned about for myself and for you as the people God has entrusted to me, is that we would miss the lessons of faith that God is trying to teach us right now. In fact, recently, I sent out an article to the board about this to say, maybe God is using this as a testing ground for us to get us ready for something else, something worse, to prepare us. Don't miss the lessons of faith, whatever they might be for you. And I think that's the great thing. God can use something like this, and he can get and use it to get to your heart and your need. Whatever that might be. Because let's think about it. No one, none of us at all want to be in this anymore. Right? We're tired of it all. In fact, Friday, I went shopping and uh, I went to a couple stores. I had to go back to the car like uh, three times to grab my mask because I just got out of the car and just walked in. I thought, I was like, man, you've been doing this for six months. What is the problem? And, and I just had that voice just saying, you're just tired of doing it. That's why. You just want to walk into a stinking store without having to put a mask on and just go about your business. And so, yes, oh, you hear me? We are frustrated about this stuff. But what is God trying to teach his people in all of this? That's one reason we're having the day of prayer, to say, okay, Lord, let us humble ourselves. Let's say, Lord, let us hear from you, whatever that might be. So crisis will either turn us to faith or to bitterness. Don't let these things bitter your heart. Turn to God in faith. In fact, the verb tense that is used here for this dad who is coming to Jesus, it's expressing that this man is 
begging Jesus to heal his son. It, it's a repeated thing. It's just not a one-time request. Jesus, will you heal my son? And, and it's more Jesus. He's falling down on his feet. He's pleading with Jesus to do this. I mean, think about that. If you had a, a very sick child, You could understand this father's feelings of, Lord, please, if you can do something, please save my son. And beloved, what we need to do is we need to follow this example of imploring the Lord, no matter what our troubles. And of course, Jesus' reply in verse 48, if you just read through the passage, it would seem rather harsh, wouldn't it? Here's this father who comes to the Lord Jesus concerned about his son and Jesus just launches into kind of a scolding. It seems that way, right? Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. I mean, here, here's a dad that's genuinely pleading for his son and that's how Jesus responds. But here's the thing. We know who's speaking here, the Lord Jesus Christ. We know what Jesus knows. He knows this man. He knows why this man is seeking him. He knows that this man is not coming to him with the full right motive yet. And again, he's speaking in generals. He's speaking to the crowd that's there, not just to this father. He's saying... You won't trust me unless I do something for you. This man was not coming to Jesus as a sinner who was seeking forgiveness and eternal life. Rather, this man was coming like a soldier in a foxhole. And Jesus wants to move him from that foxhole faith to a genuine one. Jesus' rebuke is intended to bring to light this man's true need. And so the Lord rebukes, the Lord's rebukes, excuse me, they are never meant to hurt us, but they are always to do us good so that we might grow in faith and obedience. Maybe this morning, the Lord would rebuke us and our faith right now. And say, what you have been doing, how you have been trusting, or not trusting, that is not what I've called you to. Now, I think this man's faith was sincere. But I think this man's faith was limited. And I think like many of Jesus' followers, he thought Jesus had to be by the son's bedside to effectively handle the situation, right? Because that's his plea. Come with me all the way 20 miles to my house to heal my son, Lord Jesus. And although we understand this man's urgency, I don't want you to overlook two things. First, he told Jesus Christ how to handle the need. And second, he presented the need before actually presenting himself. How much better it would have been for him to simply lay himself and lay his problems at Jesus' feet and allow Jesus to handle it. Just to say, Lord Jesus, here I am. I am not worthy. But my son is in need. Will you please help me? Now, we might think, well, okay, but that's how he responded. But we also have instances of this in the other Gospels where men did do that. In fact, there was another official whose uh, child was sick. And he came to Jesus. And Jesus said he was amazed about that man's faith. Because he came and he said, Jesus, I am not worthy for you to come to my home. But if you just speak the word, I know that my child will be healed. And Jesus literally has a step back moment. And says, I have not found faith like this in all of Israel. And I believe this was a Gentile who was saying this to Jesus. And because he said, 
Lord Jesus, I understand. I have authority. And so I say to this person, to that person as an official, you do this, you do that, and they do it. And so, Jesus, all you have to do, because you have the authority, you just speak the word, and my son, my child will be healed. And so we do see faith like that in the Gospels. That's what Jesus is responding to here. This man should have come and said, Lord, I'm not worthy of you, but would you please heal my son? Jesus, you handle this problem the way you want to handle it, and I will trust you. Beloved, here's the point. All too often, we're like this guy. I know that I am. We don't pray unless we're in a crisis. We keep Jesus on a shelf like he's a genie in a lamp. And when we need him, we pull him off the shelf. We try to manipulate him into helping us in the exact way we want him to do it. But after the difficulty passes, we put him back on the shelf and we get on with our life without acknowledging him. But beloved, the Lord Jesus Christ does not want to be worshipped as a lamp. He wants to be worshipped as Lord. He wants us to believe in him for who he is and to fellowship with him at all times, not just when we need something, not just when things are bad and we need him to get us out of a jam, but when we need him all the time, to worship him all the time. Think about it. Think about how we relate with others. Have you ever had someone who has treated you that way. They seem to only want to come to you when they are in need, when they have a problem, when they want to get something out of you. You ever had a relationship like that? I have. But it seems like, how come you don't call me in the good times? How come you don't check on it? You just want to to get something from me. Parents, think about that. If your children only came to you when they wanted to borrow money, When they wanted to borrow the car. It's like that mindset. That's what Jesus is saying. That's the wrong type of faith. In fact, that's not faith at all. The third thing is this. Faith that is confident. Verses 49 through 50. Often we have a preconceived idea of how the Lord must work in any situation. How we would solve the problem. If we were in it and had the power to do it. And this man had fixed in his mind that Jesus must come with him for his son to be healed. Jesus could have gone with him, certainly. He could have healed the boy in his presence. I mean, he had done that, it was said, with Jairus' daughter in Luke chapter 8. But Jesus wanted to develop this man's faith. And so instead, he places a choice. Before this man, the man has said to him, come, but Jesus says to him, what? Go. Your son lives. That's the truth, right? Well, what could this man have done? He could have said, well, Jesus, are you sure? Well, Jesus, I still want you to come with me. And, you know, just in case that didn't work when you said this man, you know, my son lives. He could have started arguing with Jesus. Well, Is that how it's going to really work? But no, he didn't. Either this man was going to doubt the word of the one in whom he had placed all his hopes for his son's recovery, or he had to believe him at that moment and then go home. When we cry to God in our need, we have a choice either to take him at his word or not. That's why, as I, we look before and worship the truth, that's why we need to crack this book. God is not silent. He has spoken his word to us, and he says to us, here is my word to you, child of God. Dear beloved one, will you trust me with what I say to you? Will you trust my promises? And of course, John reports a great thing here. He reports this man's response. It says he believed Jesus' words. That's great, isn't it? He believed Jesus' word. 
Note here that the man that Jesus answered the man's desire, which was he wanted his son to be healed, but he did not answer the man's request, which was to come to his house. The man had to put aside his expectations of how Jesus would work and take him at his word, and so do we. Let's be honest. We put expectations of how we think Jesus should work this situation out. Right? Come on. You know where this is going. Jesus calls us to trust him and to take him at his word. Whether that is for our eternal salvation or in life's trials. And here's the thing. The one is actually connected to the other. If we won't believe God's word concerning who Jesus is, and what he has done for us in the cross and his resurrection, then how can we believe him for anything else? Or maybe we should say the opposite way. Have you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that when you die, you will be with him forever in eternity? Amen? You're trusting in that? Can he not handle the situation you're facing right now? Can he not handle the problems of your life, whatever they might be? Many years ago, my dad gave me a, very, a little poem that has stuck in my mind. And it's helped me to believe in the word of God, no matter my emotions, no matter my logic, no matter my experience, or no matter what others might be saying. It has been a, a compass for me to continually to point me to what is true. Here it is. Feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the word of God, not else is worth believing. I'll trust in God's unchanging word till soul and body sever. For although all earth shall pass away, his word abides forever. That plays often in my mind in those times of uncertainty. What are you trusting in? If you're trusting in your feelings, your feelings are going to come. Your feelings are going to go, Matt. Your feelings are sort of, sometimes they're going to deceive you. But the word of God never will. Amen? Amen. Well, let's turn to the fourth thing, and that's faith confirmed. This man believed the word about his son, that his son was healed, and he demonstrated that belief by going home. And in verses 51 through 54, we, he has his faith confirmed. When we come to understand who Jesus Christ really is, when we trust him apart from his solving our crisis, we're going to see genuine faith. The father left Jesus, but he left Jesus absolutely assured that Jesus had promised healing and that he rested in that promise. And on his way home, it says, his servants met him at some point, and they confirmed what his faith already knew, that his son was healed. I love this picture. Verse 51, as he was going down, going down to his home, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. What a great testimony of faith. This man walked, let's say, for a whole day, trusting, being assured, Jesus' was, word was true. And now it's confirmed. Jesus kept his word. Jesus kept, keeps his promises. He believed that Jesus was no ordinary man. 
but he believed that Jesus was who he truly said he was. Jesus will do what he truly said he will do. You know, God doesn't often give us immediate answers to our request like this. But even then, we must trust that he has a good reason for his delays and that his waiting is somehow better for us. John Calvin applies this to our hearts by saying that while we wait, we should consider how much of concealed distrust there is in us, or at least how small and limited our faith is. Think about that. While we wait on the Lord to answer our prayers, one of the things the Lord wants us to do is to consider, am I really trusting him? Do I believe, really believe his word? Or to really just say, you know what? My faith is small, Lord. Increase my faith. Strengthen my faith. Well, let's make this practical. Beloved, how is God calling you to trust his word today? What crisis are you in? What future are you facing that you say, I don't know what's going to happen here. I don't know what's going to occur. I'm certainly concerned about these things. How do you need to trust him? And as you wait, how will you renew? How will you refine your faith in him? You know, I often expect God to answer in my way and in my timing. But sometimes that expectation isn't revealed until he doesn't do the thing the way I want him to do it or in the timing I want him to do it. I think I'm trusting him. I think I'm laying this at his feet. And yet then God reveals, you're not really. So when he doesn't work on my timetable, when he doesn't use the methods that I would think is best. When he doesn't act according to my expectations, I then tend to doubt his love. I doubt his care. Do you do that too? It's clear. We, we all need to grow in faith in his ways and allow him to be God. And he has promised he has promised he will work all things together for our good and his glory, even if we don't see it in our own lifetime. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this lesson today, lessons of faith. And Lord, I pray that each one of us, uh, you, you know exactly where we are in our walk with you. You know what our faith needs today, this week. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would take this truth and you would apply it to each person hearing these words. You would help them to examine and to be honest before you. Lord, even if that honesty is uh, an expression of anger and just say, I I'm mad that you're doing this. I'm mad that this is happening. Lord, let them be truthful. Not in a way of shaking their fists, but having an open hand. And let them be genuine with you because you already know but lord let that not stay there let it turn to lord trust and to worship and to giving you all that you deserve holy spirit we thank you that you're so kind and so patient with us and i pray lord you apply these things and i pray it in jesus name amen